Bruce Gagnon is the coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. He was a co-founder of the Global Network when it was created in 1992. Between 83 and 98, he was the state coordinator of the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice and has worked on space issues for 34 years. In 1987, he organized the largest peace protest in Florida history when over 5,000 people marched on Cape Canaveral in opposition to the first flight test of the Trident II nuclear missile. Bruce was the organizer of the Cancel Cassini campaign, uh, cancel Cassini campaign, excuse me, launched 72 pounds of plutonium into space in 1997 that drew enormous support and media coverage around the world and was featured on the TV program 60 Minutes. Bruce is a Vietnam era veteran, excuse me, Vietnam era veteran and began his organizing career by working for the United Farm Workers Union in Florida organizing fruit pickers. He is an active member of Veterans for Peace. Bruce. Thank you all. Thank you, Leah. I want to say that Leah uh, facilitated and moderated our organizing committee for this conference. She worked very hard. Please give her a hand. And Bob Azab was sort of the volunteer coordinator that did most of the legwork, the day-to-day -day work. I don't know if he's in the room right now, but please be sure to give Baum and Azad uh, a, a hand as well. All right, so uh, I'm going to start with just a few words, and then we're going to show a video from Australia. I think it's about a five-minute video from Nick Dean, who's a really wonderful uh, activist from Australia, sending his greetings. And then we're going to hear from our three speakers in the order of Hyun Lee from uh, Korea speaking first, then Will Griffin, a Veterans for Peace member. Uh, he's speaking second, mostly about Okinawa. And then third will be Bernadette Eloran from uh, the Philippines, talking about uh, uh, her work uh, around the Philippines issue. So uh, let me just say that uh, I think, as you all know, that this conference is about building international solidarity. And we really can't get there having a true global movement, a unified movement where we're working together, unless we here in the United States really stretch our minds and our hearts so that we can better understand what is really going on around the world. I know all of us have some part of the world that we really specialize on, for example, but we don't always make the connections on the broader issues, and I think we have to do more of that. And that broadening comes from study and travel and events like this one here. It's also good to make stronger connections between our local realities, our local manifestations of the military-industrial complex. For example, in my community where I live, in Bath, Maine, we have a Navy shipyard that builds destroyers for the Navy. And so we've been trying to get people in our community, in our state, to think about these ships. Where do they go when they leave Bath? Because people think they are defending the, the uh, United States. Well, they're not. They're forward deployed offensive weapon systems. And so we've developed a relationship with places like Jeju Island in Korea that was torn apart in order to build a Navy base to port these U.S. warships. And so we've sent quite a few Mainers over the last few years to Jeju so they can come back and talk to people in our state about how these warships, where they go, affects other people. And then we've brought Koreans repeatedly to our community. Just in the last few days, another example of where these destroyers from Bath go, we've learned that there, it's, uh, there's a U.S. Navy destroyer now ported in Odessa, Ukraine. Ukraine, where the United States in 2014 really unleashed a coup d'etat in order to destabilize the border of Russia, in order to excuse NATO expansion right up to the Russian border. And so we see today uh, this 
Asia-Pacific pivot, which we're going to be talking about here on this panel, essentially created by the Obama administration and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. This idea of moving a strong percentage of U.S. military operations into the Asia-Pacific, which will necessitate more airfields for our war planes, more barracks for our troops, and more ports of call for our warships. And as a result of that, then we see an expansion and an encirclement, largely, of Russia and China in the region. All of this is really being done because the United States hears language coming out of Russia and China talking about a multipolar world, a world where more than one country makes the decisions about what's going on. And the United States just can't handle that kind of a concept. And so the U.S. is working overtime in order to try to topple this movement towards multipolar world before it's too late. And so Washington understands that its days are numbered and that they've got to move quickly in order to maintain full spectrum dominance of the globe. And so today in the Asia Pacific, we see the United States and NATO creating new partnerships with countries like Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, bringing them into NATO, an expanding NATO alliance. Asia Pacific doesn't have anything to do with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but they're using NATO as a military arm of corporate capital into that region, which is turning it, of course, as we all know, into a powder keg today. So let's, uh, first of all, hear from Nick Dean in Australia, one of the great activists there, and then we'll move on to our panel. Thank you all for listening. Hello, greetings, and good day from Down Under to all of you taking part in the Baltimore Conference. My name is Nick Dean, and I'm with the Independent and Peaceful Australia Network, or IPAN. IPAN represents the many Australian groups that resent our nation's apparent subservience to the USA in all matters military. We may be geographically distant from you, but we're close to you in many ways. <clears throat> Out of loyalty to its powerful ally, the USA, Australia has been drawn into war after war, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. And Australia also plays host to some very important US bases, the most notable being the communications facility at Pine Gap in our country's red center. Because of its location in the Southern Hemisphere, linked with satellites and geostationary orbit, Pine Gap is uniquely located to complete US worldwide surveillance. According to a leading expert on the base, Professor Richard Tanter, Pine Gap is possibly the most important intelligent facility outside the United States, playing a vital role in the collection of a very wide range of signals intelligence. It provides early warning of ballistic, ballistic missile launches, supports arms control verification, assists in targeting of nuclear weapons, provides real-time battlefield intelligence data for US armed forces in active operation, critically supports United States and Japanese missile defense, and most chillingly, contributes targeting data for United States drone attacks responsible for extrajudicial killings. The goal of full spectrum dominance would not be achievable without Pine Gap. Opposition to this base has a long history in Australia, but we do not know how much its significance is recognized elsewhere. IPAN started to emerge as an organization following the 2011 announcement that US Marines were to be routinely stationed in Darwin in Northern Australia. As with Pine Gap, the authorities do not classify Darwin as a US base. However, the rotational presence there of up to 2,500 US Marines is a clear indication 
that Australia will align itself with the USA in any future dispute that might arise between the USA and China. This makes enemies for Australia when we in IPAN feel that we need have none at all. Consequently, the Darwin garrison is becoming a focus for opposition to the presence of US bases in Australia. As an organisation, IPAN is growing in strength with support coming from the union movement, faith-based faith groups such as the Quakers and what established organisations like the Medical Association for the Prevention of War. Last September, we held our fourth annual conference in Melbourne and there David Vine, who is to address your conference, made an extremely valuable contribution to ours. We couldn't send a delegate to Baltimore. But we in IPAN are delighted that your conference is taking place. We support wholeheartedly the notion that there are too many US bases in too many foreign countries. And we would gladly see the US taking a less threatening role in world affairs. We aspire to an Australia that is truly independent of all foreign military influences. In this regard, we sense that we are close friends in the struggle for a more peaceful world. Uh, first up again then is Hyun Lee. Uh, Hyun Lee is with the task force to stop that in Korea and militarism in Asia and the Pacific. She's also one of the creators of a new website called Zoom in Korea. And I hope you'll check it out, Zoom in Korea. Uh, she and others do some really great, up-to-date, up-to-minute reporting from Korea. Please welcome Hyun Lee. Good afternoon. Who has food coma? <laughs> I kind of do right now. So I'm going to do my best to stay awake and energetic. So I hope you will also stay with me and stay awake. Um, South Korea is the third largest uh, host of U.S. troops overseas. There are currently 23,000 U.S. troops stationed there. The narrative that we are all familiar with is that the U.S. made heroic sacrifices to save South Korea from communist aggression during the Korean War, that North Korea continues to be a maniacal threat, and that's why our troops are still there today. The U.S. ROK alliance is treated as something that is sacrosanct, and questioning it is considered treasonous. What we don't hear about is the long history of the South Korean people's fight against U.S. bases, the very offensive nature of the joint military exercises, and how the U.S. ROK alliance undermines South Korea's sovereignty and actually stands in the way of peace and reunification in Korea. So that's what I will talk about today. So let's first start with the origin of the U.S. ROK alliance. At the end of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union were discussing what they're going to do with Japan's colonies, including Korea and two U.S. officers drew an arbitrary line at the 38th parallel. There was no consultation with the Korean people. The United States set up a military government in the southern part of Korea, and Koreans south of the 38th parallel thought that the Americans were coming to liberate them from the Japanese. But the Americans reinstalled in government positions the very same Koreans who had collaborated with the Japanese. And then the United States and its puppet leader, Sung Man Ri, carried out a protracted and very systematic campaign of counter-revolutionary violence to decimate so-called communist insurgents, most of whom were people who had fought for national independence under Japan's colonial rule at least 100,000 people, probably a lot more, were killed in the late 1940s. This is before the Korean War even began, by security forces installed and directed by the United States. So this was the origin of US military presence in Korea. 
Just as violence and coercion were central to the very foundation of this country, going back to the genocide of the indigenous people and the transatlantic slave trade, violence and coercion were also at the heart of how the U.S., the United States, imposed itself in Korea. And then the U.S.-ROK alliance came about through the Mutual Defense Treaty that was signed in 1953 after the Korean War, But this treaty was in violation of the armistice agreement that was signed just a few months before that, which stated that within three months of signing the armistice, a conference should be held to discuss the withdrawal of all foreign troops and a peaceful settlement of the conflict should be discussed. That conference obviously never happened, which is why Korea has been in a perpetual state of ceasefire without an official end to the Korean War. China obviously withdrew its troops, the United States did not. Since then, the South Korean military has been under the command of U.S. generals, and that is how U.S. bases came to be in South Korea. So are they, meaning the U.S. forces in Korea, a benevolent force protecting the South Korean people, or are they an occupying force? So let's turn now to the history of the South Korean people's struggle against U.S. bases. So the first time I personally began to question the dominant narrative about the U.S. ROK alliance was when I was in my early 20s, when I first heard about the death of a woman named Yoon Gum Yi. That was in 1992. She was a 26-year-old woman working in one of the many camp towns that had developed around the U.S. bases in South Korea. She was raped and then murdered by Kenneth Markle, a 20-year-old U.S. soldier of the 2nd Infantry Division, then stationed in Dongducheon. Her body was found with an umbrella in her rectum, two beer bottles in her uterus, a Coca-Cola bottle in her vagina, broken matchsticks in her mouth, and detergent poured all over her body. The cause of her death was excessive bleeding. According to the status of forces agreement between the two countries, South Korea and the United States, the local police had no jurisdiction to detain Markle, and they had to turn him over to the base. This sparked a nationwide movement to revise the SOFA agreement, and this was the first time the country came to acknowledge the long history of rape and sexual violence against women in the camp towns. And due to the courageous organizing by women in the camp towns and also feminist groups, Kenneth Markle was eventually, he eventually received a 15-year prison sentence, of which he served 12, and then he was paroled in 2006 and extradited to the United States. That fight was then followed by the struggle in Meihangni to shut down a U.S. bombing range For decades, the residents there had experienced serious health issues due to the noise pollution caused by constant target practice that went on there every day, 10 hours a day. And for 10 long years, the residents waged a very lonely fight to voice their grievances. In 1987, they were the first ones to stage an occupation of a U.S. base in South Korea. They entered the base, lay down on the bombing range, and refused to budge until their grievances were heard. They were violently removed, but finally in 2000, many years later, they were joined by student groups and other mass movement organizations that rallied to their cause. That was the same time that the movement against the bombing range in Vieques was going on. There was a lot of cross-solidarity between those two movements to shut down the bombing range in Meihangni and also in Vieques. And then the movement successfully shut down the bombing range in 2004, but similar to Vieques, to this day the U.S. refuses to clean up the toxic contamination it left behind. While that fight was going on, two teenage girls were walking on a two-lane road near rice fields in Dongducheon. On their way to a friend's birthday party, they were crushed to death by a U.S. armored vehicle of the 2nd Infantry Division. That was in 2002. Again, according to SOFA, The South Korean authorities had no jurisdiction to investigate the incident. High school students in Dongducheon rallied and they tried to deliver petitions to U.S. authorities at Camp Casey, but they were violently turned away. 
That incident fueled anti-U.S. sentiment during the 2002 World Cup hosted by South Korea and Japan that summer. Following mass anti-U.S. demonstrations, South Korea's Justice Ministry requested that the U.S. military give up jurisdiction over the two soldiers. The U.S. military refused. The two soldiers that were responsible were court-martialed at Camp Casey on charges of negligent homicide, but they were acquitted. Uh, in 2004, the United States and South Korea agreed to move the U.S. Army garrison in Yongsan and the 2nd Infantry Division into Pyeongtaek, which is south of Seoul. The, this required the displacement of elderly farmers from their homes and farmland in a village called Dechuri to make way for the expansion of Camp Humphreys. Farmers opposed to the base expansion held candlelight protests for 935 consecutive days. That fight galvanized progressive movements across the country. The South Korean police set up checkpoints at every entryway to the village to isolate the farmers and block supporters from outside who wished to join them at the protests. They also laid barbed wire across the land where the farmers had just planted seeds to grow rice. They bulldozed the local schoolyard where the farmers gathered for their nightly candlelight protests. And then the government sent in the army to crack down on protesters. After many years of fighting, the government bulldozed the farmers' homes and forced them to evacuate. The next slide is about the Jeju Naval Base. I won't go into detail about that fight in the interest of time. I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this uh, fight. I will just note one point that starting last year, after seven years of the U.S. government saying, we have nothing to do with this base, this is a South Korean base, it's not being constructed to house our Aegis destroyers, what was docked at the newly opened naval base last year during the joint military exercises? It's a U.S. Aegis destroyer. The next slide is about the Sangju uh, fight against the U.S. THAAD missile defense system. Uh, I will also not go into detail about that because I'm sure many of you have heard a lot about it. Lastly, I'll just talk about the issue of toxic cont contamination on U.S. bases. So decades of U.S. presence on bases around the country have polluted South Korea's earth and the groundwater. In the case of the U.S. Army garrison in Yongsan, it covers more than 750 acres in the heart of the capital city of Seoul. So that's what, that's like the size of maybe 10 nine-yard golf courses or something like that. The base has been occupied by U.S. forces since 1953. According to the Land Partnership Plan signed in 2002, this is a plan to consolidate and reallocate U.S. bases in South Korea. The U.S. forces in Yongsan, they will relocate to Pyeongtaek, and then Yongsan will be returned to South Korea this year in 2018 and then uh, they plan to turn it into a public park. However, there's serious pollution on this base, and this has been the matter of a dispute between the U.S. forces in Korea and then the Seoul Metropolitan Government about who should be responsible for the cleanup. Large amounts of oil have been leaked on this base. The U.S. forces have shared very little information about it. For more than 10 years, the U.S. forces rejected repeated requests by the Seoul city government for permission to conduct uh, an on-site inspection. And then finally, in 2015, there was a joint, a limited joint investigation that was conducted both by the South Korean and U.S. forces personnel. But the South Korean Ministry of Environment refused to make the findings public um, and the base is inaccessible to local authorities. So South Korean NGOs, environmental groups, and progressive lawyers had to sue the Ministry of Environment. They finally got them to disclose limited amount of information about the groundwater pollution of the toxins that were discovered uh, in the groundwater around the base and in the base were benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene, collectively referred to as BTEX. They are volatile organic compounds found in crude oil-based products. Long-term exposure uh, will cause cancer. Uh, so this land will be returned to South Korea, but the South Korean government has no way of knowing what they're getting back. Uh, uh, and so the, 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 the extent and the nature of the groundwater and soil pollution on the base uh, is unknown. Um, 
And according to the Status of Forces Agreement, there is no legal means for South Korea to hold the U.S. forces accountable for pollution on these bases. So far, $185 million in South Korean tax dollars have been spent on cleanup efforts around the country uh, on U.S. bases. The U.S. has not paid for any of it. So South Koreans uh, are told that this is the price they have to pay. Rape, sexual assault, disposition of land, environmental pollution, diversion of tax dollars, loss of sovereignty. These are all prices they are told they have to pay for the sake of the U.S. ROK alliance. But we should ask ourselves, whose interest does this alliance really serve? I'll end there. I wanted to talk about recent Korean events. I'm sure you heard about around the Olympics and all of that, and what does that all mean for the rest of the year? But hopefully we'll discuss that in the Q&A. Thank you, Hyun. There's so much happening in, in Korea. I think that uh, I've been saying for a long time, I believe of all the places I've visited, I would say that the Koreans are just about the best organizers I've seen anywhere. They involve families, children, and everything they do. Uh, and so it's really a remarkable, remarkable experience to go to Korea and participate in the struggles there. So anyone that can go there, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, Will Griffin is an Army veteran, a member of Veterans for Peace. He was in Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Uh, he's uh, become very, very important in the peace movement and is now uh, creating a uh, website called The Peace Report where he makes videos on all different kind of subjects about Korea. Recently, he was on the Veterans for Peace delegation to Okinawa and made some wonderful videos. You saw the one uh, last night that we showed uh, from Okinawa as well. So please welcome uh, Will Griffin. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Um, I've got a lot of things to talk about, but first, uh, Hyun, I'm half Korean. Uh, I was in Korea earlier this year with Jill Stein, Medea Benjamin, and Rhys Chenault from U.S. Labor Against the War, and we visited the site of the THAAD missile, def missile offense system um, in Songju. And we have these scarves, if you've seen them, out front. I don't know if I hold it there for a second. Uh, it, these scarves are free. They're up there at the Global Network table. You can grab them. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, I will be speaking about Okinawa. Um, but first, I gotta, I gotta say thank you for, for organizing this conference. Um, military bases has been, military has been my whole life. Is there anybody else here who was born on a foreign military base? Oh, one, two? Oh, young, younger people too. Great, well I was born in a country that technically doesn't exist anymore, uh, West Germany, uh, Nuremberg Army Hospital. Stayed there for three years, then I moved to South Korea uh, I lived right outside of Camp Humphreys, and um, after that, moved all around the states, joined the military myself, and went to Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so, it, that, you know, Okinawa is so important right now, especially with this co coalition against U.S. foreign military bases. Some of you may have heard me say last night that I really think that Okinawa is leading the movement against military bases around the world and have been doing so for decades. So this is Okinawa. So when I think of Okinawa, this is what I this is the image I think of. How many you know how many of you do you, do you know that Okinawans are not Japanese? Okay, maybe half, a little bit, 60%. Um, yeah, they are the indigenous people of the Okinawa Island that was colonized by Japan. And um, after World War II, Okinawa, U.S. took, the U.S. military, not the government, the military, took over Okinawa from World War II to 1972, and then returned it back to Japan. So it's been flip-flopping under, under Japan and under the U.S. Some facts about Okinawa. It's a tiny island, but it's got a million and a half people. It's got 54,000 U.S. troops, 42,000 dependents of those troops, 8,000 DOD civilians, 25,000 Japanese workers on the bases. You can find this information at uh, USFJ, 
Mil, which is U.S. Forces Japan. Approximately 18.4 percent of the island belongs to the U.S. military base infrastructure. Could you imagine what state you live in if 20 percent of that land was taken by a foreign military base? They were raping the young women in your town, polluting your, your community, um, and intervening in your political system. So I usually tell people there's 32 bases on there, but it's the number of bases I think is kind of, it, it doesn't matter. Just say 20% of the island. I think that's what most people will say, wow, 20% of the island is taken by U.S. military forces. So Okinawa is, strict, is in a strategic location, uh, especially since the Asia pivot was announced in 2011, and especially since China's economy has been growing and the U.S. sees that as a direct threat. Um, and in the Asia Pacific, you have some of the top economies in the world. The U.S. is in there, the number one economy in the world. China, the second economy in the world. Japan, the third econ largest economy in the world. Um, and South Korea is, I think, nine right now, largest economy in the world. Not to mention um, a lot, East and South Asia have half of the world's population. Um, the disadvantage that they say is that is vulnerable missile attacks, which Okinawa wouldn't be a target if there wasn't 54,000 or 54,000 U.S. Marines on the island occupying it. So here's a little bit of Okinawa history I went over. So Okinawa originally, we'll go from left to right. Originally was the Ryukyu Kingdom. The in 1879, Japanese annexed it. 1945 happened. U.S. military took control of the island. And 1972 was, uh, it had a reversion back to the Japan government. One of the big issues in Okinawa right now is the relocation of the Futenma Air Base, also known as the world's most dangerous air base. Um, so they want to relocate this to... So if you look on the map on the bottom, it says Air Station Futenma. It's going to move up to the Hinoko District on the bay. Uh, Oro, Oro Bay is what it's called. Um, very pristine, very beautiful uh, areas that the people are trying to protect. Um, also, the second, another issue is the northern tra training area up north in the red, where they're trying to build more helipads for the already accident-prone Osprey V-22 helicopters. Um, that, by the way, will fly over people's homes and schools uh, anywhere from 1 o'clock in, in the morning to, to at noon. And these kids have to practice getting underneath tables because windows are literally falling out of helicopters and crashing into the, 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 the ceiling or the roofs of this uh, building and just all kinds of things that should not be happening and, are not held, and the U.S. is not held accountable for any of these. This is a picture of the world's most dangerous air base. Look at all the housing around it. There, I've spoken to Okinawa University students. They don't know what life is like without having helicopters fly over their head every two hours or more. So one thing they're working on now is they, um, they found an environmental review of Futenma Air Base in 2012. And this is, a, this is a map from the environmental review. On each end of the airfield, they're supposed to have a clear zone just in case for accidents. Well, over time, people started moving into these clear zones. The reason why is because they don't have anywhere else to live. And the U.S. acknowledges this and doesn't care to do anything about it. So all of these people are in a, living in zones that they should not, you, no one should be living this close on an airfield. This is another photo of Futenma. You can see the, the housing around this airfield. Um, so this is where they want to move it to uh, Camp Schwab or a bay, beautiful place. And they want to fill it up and turn it into a V-shaped airstrip. Um, and people have been protesting this for over 13 years. Uh, they just reached 5,000 days, day after day, of sit-ins in front of Camp Schwab. Yeah, give it up for the Okinawa people. Amazing, amazing. This, this is what it's supposedly going to look like in five or ten years or if they ever begin construction. The good thing about it is they announced this, this plan, this relocation plan, in 1996. It's supposed to be done around 2023, 2025. Nearly no construction has been done. There's photos of construction workers out there 
looking like they're doing things, but they're legally not allowed to do anything because there's no permits that's been allowed. Because Okinawa has a governor that is against the bases, mayors that are against these bases, representatives that are against these bases. It is deeply entrenched in their political system. The problem is Japanese people are racist against Okinawan people, right? So they don't want to listen to them. It's almost similar to how we treat the Native Americans here. It's a little, it's kind of hard to understand because we, our racist, racism is usually skin color, skin tone. But Okinawans, from our perspective, Okinawans, Japanese may look similar, but to them it's a whole new racist dynamic that they do. So the U.S. goes up to Japan and says, hey, we need more bases in Japan. Japan says, okay, we'll put it on Okinawa, not on mainland Japan. And that's been going on for decades. So we just went to Camp Schwab a few weeks ago, and we stood in solidarity with the Okinawa people who love to sing and dance, and I think that's something we should all work on here in the U.S. Um, of course, we didn't stay there too long until the Japanese police took us away. By the way, these aren't Okinawan police. These are Japanese police that come from different prefectures around the country because the Okinawan people understand their neighbors, and they don't want to arrest them. So what they had to start doing, same thing in Korea and Jeju Island, is start sending police forces from other parts of the country. Because they don't have a, one, they're racist, they don't like Okinawan people, and they think they're subhuman. And two, they don't, they don't listen to what their government has to say. Bruce Gagnon getting carried away for, I don't know, the 12th millionth time. <laughs> we had a lot of new people that came on. Their first delegation, Enya, who was a force recon marine in the invasion of Iraq. Um, so... This is a news article that came out about um, hitting 5,000 days of protests, but the sit-ins began in April 19, 2004, uh, and the daily sit-ins have been over for 13 years, and 70 to 80 percent of the island opposes these two new bases, the relocation of Futenma and the helipads up north. 70 to 80 percent. So we're definitely not exporting democracy. This is the governor of Okinawa. He was elected in 2014 on an anti-base platform. You cannot run a campaign without having a stance on these bases in Okinawa. Uh, he has since continued to resist construction, and uh, he's even traveled to the U.S. Uh, a few times to try to spread the issues. Um, this is a shot of Takai that we went to last year, um, where we're trying to stop the construction trucks. And we actually did. We shut the bridge down. No construction trucks came through. <laughs> And we partied for like an hour or two on the bridge. So this is like the people taking their land back. That's what, that's what I saw. And it was just a, 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 the best moment. Um, but you know what they did? They, they sent the Japanese self-defense forces and brought the construction trucks over our head back onto the bases. They're that determined to do it. Um, I just want to, I have to prove to you that Okinawa is not a typical place for bases. It is a very unique place, and I'm not trying to take away anything away from any other places, because I know there's tons, tons of bases around the world. But Okinawa is unique in this way, and I'll explain it through a book review that Douglas Loomis gave me, who helped organize many of these VFP delegations. And he wrote a book review of the 2004 book, Sorrows of Empire, written by Chalmers Johnson. Let me just read a few paragraphs. Chalmers Johnson, began a study of the U.S. military base structure around the world and gradually came to the conclusion that Okinawa was typical, not unique. And he proposed the interesting new hypothesis. These numbers are old. The 725 plus U.S. bases around the world are not the means to empire. They are the empire. The bases are not built to serve a strategy for protecting U.S. interests. Rather, U.S. strategy is, in part, designed to protect the bases. The bases are themselves a form of rule and generate their own interests. They are organized into regional commands and regional commanders, just like the Roman Empire, outranking ambassadors, making foreign policy statements, and reporting directly to the president rather than through the normal chain of command. In most of the countries where the United States has bases, U.S. military personnel enjoy the colonial privilege of extraterritoriality thanks to the status of forces agreements, SOFAs, which protect them wholly or partially from prose prosecution under the laws of the country where they are based. The United States admits having such agreements with 93 countries, though some SOFAs are not so embarrassing to, ho to the host nation that they are kept secret, particularly in the Islamic world. 
These empire of bases, as Johnson calls it, forms a world of its own, an aspect of contemporary American life that most Americans never see. Here on Okinawa, where I live, if you drive up Highway 58 from Naha, past Kadena Air Base, and then look across the fence into the base, you will see a parking lot filled with scores of big school buses. So there are many children in there, tragically and unconsciously living the lives of colonials. Inside the bases, there are schools from daycare through college, college, churches, shopping malls, bars, restaurants, tennis courts, private beaches, many individual and team sports, a counseling group for controlling stress and anger, a hotline for battered women, a rape survivors group, a childhood sexual abuse survivors group, police, courts, jails, and countless lawnmowers, not only for the golf courses, but also for the lawns on the big empty spaces between the scattered buildings. Outside the bases, although Okinawa's relatively prosperity compared compared to the 1950s and 1960s, has shut down a lot of the businesses aimed at GI trade. There are still bars, restaurants, tattoo parlors, souvenir shops, selling things that no Japanese or Okinawan would ever buy, whorehouses, and a large number of ev evangelical churches, these that generally have American minis uh, ministers. <laughs> to be stationed on such a base is to be given an education in colonial arrogance. Disrespect for the local population is an individual attitude one may or may not have. It is in the air, it is built in the structure of things, it is unconscious. Johnson's conclusion that Okinawa is typical, not unique, is one with which few Okinawans would agree. It is correct that the Okinawa bases are not an isolated case, but rather part of a world system of bases operating under a unified imperial policy. But it ignores the old Hegelian principle that quantity becomes quality. The sheer scale of the U.S. military presence on Okinawa means that they dominate daily life in a way that, say, Italy does not, or Britain does not, or Greenland does not, or even mainland Japan. In Okinawa, there is no place free from the scream of fighter planes and the roar of giant transports overhead. There is no day in which one, some news about the bases is not in the newspaper. There is no politician who can carry out a campaign without taking a position on them, and there is no one under 60 who can remember when they were not there. And as he said, thank you. That was, uh, Douglas Loomis is an amazing activist and writer. He's got tons and tons of books. But Okinawa, again, is part of the Asia pivot. And this pivot, look, I mean, if you just look at this map and see what's going on and put it into context, it's scary. Add to that the eight, you know, everything we've been talking about, the 800 military bases around the world, the trillion dollars a year we spend on the military uh, industrial complex, the private sector of the industrial complex, the think tanks, the, the researchers, all that. Not to mention the wars that we're currently in. Um, so this pivot is, is, one, it's so important because Asia has nuclear weapons. It's not like a lot of the other places that we've been to. I'm not saying it's more important. I'm just saying they have nuclear weapons. It's a big deal now. China's becoming the second, you know, predicted to be the largest economy in the world soon. We have to keep an eye on these types of things. I just want to go over what you can do. I have a lot of things that you can do, but if you just go to thepeacereport.com slash Okinawa. I think I gave him the wrong slide. But anyways, thepeacereport.com slash Okinawa has all this information, plus I have more organizations that you can tie into. One thing I highly recommend what you can do, go to Okinawa. Go there. We have the organizations, we have the people, we have the power, we can do it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Will Griffin. Give him another hand. The Peace Report. Write it down. The Peace Report. Check it out. I think that uh, we've already seen we have a lot to learn from Okinawa and Korea. Can you imagine here in the United States of America having a protest every single day for 10 or 15 years? Can you all imagine going home? When you go home, 
uh, tomorrow, the next day, and you go back to your local group, and they say, how was the conference? And you go, I've got a great idea. We're going to organize a protest, and we're going to go out there every day for the next 13 years. And even sometimes at night, too. Okay, and people are going to look at you and walk away, right? We think, you know, we do a protest once a month. We think we're pretty hot stuff. We've got a lot to learn. All right. Next, we're going to welcome our third speaker, Bernadette Ellerin. She's with, uh, she's with the U.S. chapter. She's a chairperson of the U.S. chapter of Bayan, or Bayan USA, an alliance of 20 Filipino organizations in the U.S. fighting for genuine independence, sovereignty, and democracy in the Philippines. Please welcome her. Oh, good afternoon. How many people here are still experiencing food coma? <laughs> I'm going to try to help you because I have to wake up too. Um, I'm going to teach you a chant. I'm going to start with a chant so we can wake up. Uh, and it pertains to our struggles here in this panel. Stop the U.S. war machine from Okinawa to Korea to the Philippines. Stop the U.S. war machine from Okinawa to Korea to the Philippines. Stop the U.S. war machine from Okinawa to Korea to the Philippines. When I mean salam. <laughs> We're good. I only have 15 minutes to talk about a whole liberation struggle. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to go right into the Philippines. I'm going to bring us up to date on what's happening to the Philippines right now with some hi important historical points. Um, the title of my presentation is The U.S. Duterte Regime's Three Wars and the Filipino people's struggle for national liberation. Uh, some historical points. Um, in 1899, the U.S. invaded the Philippines, and, um, which led to uh, the Philippine-American War because the Filipinos fought back. Uh, this war in our history books is called an insurgency, an insurrection. It was a war. It annihilated one-fourth of the Philippine population. Um, in 19 1890, uh, uh, the U.S. Um, colonial government, because the Philippines was a direct U.S. colony after that war, um, set up the, its first uh, military installation in the Philippines, which was Subic uh, U.S. Naval Reservation. And for many years, it was the largest U.S. overseas military until 1992 when it shut down. It was the size of Singapore, for those, if you want a reference. Subic Naval Base was the, si is, was the size of Singapore. Um, in 1903, um, the U.S. established the, its Air Force Base at Clark in Angeles City, um, which shut down in 1991. Uh, in 1947, uh, the U.S. Uh, Republic of the Philippines Military Bases Agreement was signed, uh, which established a 99-year lease um, uh, the U.S. government had over the Philippines rent-free. Uh, in 1946, the U.S. granted, in quotes, the Philippines independence. So um, we don't consider that genuine independence. Um, in 1951, uh, the U.S. and the Philippine government signed a mutual defense treaty, or the MDT, which is a treaty. So it's essentially a framework, a framework agreement, no? which many other agreements refer to. Uh, and the MDT basically says that, um, that the U.S. and the Philippines are friends. And, um, uh, and if ever one of them is attacked by an external party, the, friend, the other friend comes and helps the other friend out. And um, so that's the framework agreement. In 1991, the Philippine Senate votes to reject the renewal of the basis agreement. So this is where we have the shutdown of Subic and Clark. And I want to correct the narrative earlier um, that it was Mount Pinatubo or the volcano or even the Senate that brought down those bases. It was the people's movement that brought down those bases. People died to shut down those bases. I don't want people to think that it was because of the Senate or because of some volcano that the U.S. left. It was because the people fought for it. Um, um, and it took many decades for that to happen. Um, uh, in 1999, uh, the Mutual Defense Treaty gave birth to the Visiting Forces Agreement, which, um, which in many ways uh, opened, which literally opened up the entire Philippines to U.S. Uh, military basing. 
Uh, if we only had two main bases before, now we, had, now we have over 20 because uh, the VFA allows for um, the U.S. military uh, access to over, to over 20 airports and seaports in the country. So now the U.S. troops are embedded in Philippine facilities. 2002, after September 11th, the Philippines was declared the second front to the global war on terror, if people recall. Um, uh, the Mutual Logistics Support Agreement, or the MLSA, I get a derivative of the Mutual Defense Treaty, gave birth to the Balikatan Exercises. The Balikatan Exercises are, um, have been annually uh, from 2002 till the present day. They're joint uh, counterterrorism exercises between the Philippine military and the U.S. military. Um, and then in 2014, we have the EDCA, or the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, um, uh, which is a de facto basing agreement. Again, it, uh, it uh, builds upon the VFA, where now the U.S. can openly build um, its own installations within um, Philippine uh, facilities. So I just came back from Mindanao, where um, there is a struggle in, in, the, in a city called Cagayan de Oro, where there is an airport called the Lumbia Airport, and um, the, U the U.S. Is, is planning to build a drone uh, center in this airport. Uh, so this is Subic, and that's Clark uh, uh, Air Force bases in the Philippines, which are technically no longer supposed to be operating. But if you, even if you go to Subic now, if you go to Subic now, you would think that um, since it shut down, that the communities there would be able to inhabit the area. But no, uh, Subic, Subic, Air, Subic now is an um, economic zone where there are big foreign multinational corporations that set up their offices there, and none of the locals can live there. Um, same with Clark. So when we t think about the Philippines now, and the headlines are dominated with um, this crazy president called uh, Rodrigo Duterte, crazy president, and, um, and his war on drugs, no? And the war on drugs is real. I'm not really going to go into it because um, uh, like all other war on drugs around the world, it's a tool for state repression. It's a means for... Uh, to profiteer off the criminalization of poor people, just like the war on drugs here in the US, the war on drugs in Latin America. Same thing. Uh, the war on terror, I said three wars. The war on terror, um, the US is currently in, the, in Mindanao, in the southern Philippines. Um, there is a war on ISIS in Mindanao. Um, in 2002, uh, the US government said that Al-Qaeda was in Mindanao. And so now ISIS is in Mindanao. I just came back um, from two months there. I was in Marawi City. I was near Marawi City uh, where ISIS was, where there's a war on ISIS. And um, it's still a war zone, even though the Duterte government has said that it's been liberated from ISIS. We couldn't enter because the war is still happening there. Um, the over 50,000 evacuees, the war in Marawi broke out in May of last year. Um, and it's still ongoing. The 50 evacuees have not, the 50,000 evacuees that we spoke with have not been allowed to come back. Um, in, the, in the meantime, the Asia Development Bank, the World Bank, and several multinational corporations around the world are now piling in to help the redevelopment plan of Marawi to build it as a tourist hub. So this is the, a new scheme where um, ISIS and airstrikes, because it was, this is what it looks like. This is Marawi City. Um, they used airstrikes primarily to decimate it, to level it to the ground. And now they say that Marawi is liberated, but really now they, they keep, the airstrikes are continuing in other parts of Mindanao, especially with the territory of the Moro people, the Bangsa Moro people. They are the Islamized indigenous of Mindanao. Uh, there are people in Mindanao that live there. They've been living there for centuries that the U.S. wants to get rid of. That's why they are waging this genocidal war against them. The, the Moros, especially because the Moros are, are, are Muslim uh, in a Christian-dominated country, and of course the war on terror also uh, uses Islamophobia. And, uh, it's a war on Islam. It uses Islamophobia to justify itself. Um, the war on the indigenous in the Mindanao, the war on the Lumads, these are the wars on people who live on the most mineral-rich land in the Philippines. The Philippines is the fifth most mineral-rich rich land in the world. You find gold, you find oil, you find copper, you find nickel, you find lots of mining operations in, the, in Mindanao. You also find the most uh, number of U.S. troops um, in Mindanao. You find the Moro and the Lumad people, and you find these genocidal wars against them. Uh, these are Moro children. 
um, that we visited. These are um, historical archival photographs of the Moro people of Mindanao, who up until now have been waging their own struggle for self-determination. Uh, the third war, which is the most important war that this movement needs to know about, is the war against the left, the war against the opposition, the war against the people's resistance in the Philippines. Um, you know, I would be remiss to, to not mention the fact that the Philippines has an armed revolutionary movement um, that has been played a pivotal role in, uh, in the anti-imperialist struggle in the country. Uh, because the reason why imperialism is able to dominate the country is because we have a puppet government and a, and a, a government that essentially is not patriotic to the Philippine interests. So until such time that that system changes, imperialists will always be allowed to dominate the Philippines. So therefore, um, it really is a national liberation struggle, not just against U.S. imperialism, but against the agents, the local reactionary agents in the Philippines that maintain the system of U.S. imperialism in the, in the country. So therefore, there is a civil war because the Philippine military is loyal to this puppet government. The Philippine military is a U.S. surrogate army. It's a proxy army. And these are the small, insidious, low-intensity conflicts that the U.S. anti-war movement has to be conscious of. That, like the brother James said earlier, that U.S. Mil in, in, uh, imperialist intervention takes many different forms. And we have a lot in common with the peoples of Latin America, the peoples of Colombia, in terms of surrogate armies, proxy armies, and counterinsurgency against those of us who are openly opposing, uh, creating public outcry against um, U.S. imperialism in the country. The killings in the Philippines now are not just of uh, the 14, over 14,000 victims of the drug war. The killings now include people from Bayan. <laughs> the killings now include people who are struggling for democratic change in the country. Um, and and this, is, this is not new. I mean, this has happened before under the, diff under the Marcos regime, under the regime of Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, where the left has always been killed. Um, when I say counterinsurgency for us, that means an assassination campaign. And again, uh, just recently, um, I was in the Philippines beginning in November to protest uh, Trump's visit during the ASEAN conference summit, in, which took place in Manila. And following um, the first bilateral uh, visit between Trump and Duterte, there were a series of um, killings against um, uh, activists uh, in the Philippines. Because now part of this counterinsurgency tactic is to accuse uh, um, the mass movement in the Philippines, of which Bayan is an integral part of, of being fronts for the Communist Party of the Philippines. Again, it's nothing new, but the CPP is the leadership of the armed revolution in the country that's waging an anti-imperialist struggle in the country. And um, of course, Bayan is, may share the same political line, but we are not espousing armed struggle. Though we recognize that we don't, dim we don't see it as a terrorist force. Uh, we see it as a needed force. Uh, so when we say stop the killings, we mean not just of the, of the drug war, but also stop the killings of people who are struggling for change in the country. Uh, this is a picture from the peace negotiations between um, the, Republic, the government of the Republic of the Philippines under Duterte and um, the National Democratic Front. The National Democratic Front of the Philippines represents the revolutionary government that's being um, established in the countryside, 71 out of 81 provinces in the country. Um, there is another government in the Philippines that is being uh, born out of the revolutionary movement in the countryside. And so uh, this civil war has been going on for almost 50 years. Actually, this year will have been 50 years. And um, uh, after the, after the um, visit between um, Trump and Duterte, the peace negotiations were uh, scrapped immediately. And the CPP uh, was reaffirmed, uh, and, and, and the New People's Army were reaffirmed to be um, a terrorist organization, which they've always, they continue to be on the US State Department's foreign terrorist list. So the most important thing you need to know about the Philippines is that people are struggling for their liberation. Um, you will never hear this in the news because, um, because the news doesn't want you to know that there are people struggling that our people actually have been struggling for a long time and have been winning, you know, battles. Um, so when we say death to imperialism, the, the, the mass media likes painting us as anti-American, anti-US. Um, of course, you all know 
that's not true. Uh, we are not anti-U.S., we are not anti-American, we are anti-U.S. imperialists, and that's very, very different, right? Um, there must be a distinction that is popularized in this country when the right wing says these are anti-American forces, they are, they are, these are anti-U.S. forces that are threats to our way of life. Um, we have to, as a U.S. anti-war movement, understand, grasp, and articulate what U.S. imperialism is to the people here in the U.S. It has nothing to do with the American people. It has nothing to do with the American people. The one percent. Um, so, and the, that this system is global, and there are national liberation struggles all over the world that are, you know, people are dying for this every day, laying their bodies down. Um, and we have a responsibility here in the U.S. to link up with them, to support them, to raise their, to raise their profiles, because at the end of the day, it's these national liberation struggles that are needed to defeat uh, global imperialism of the U.S. So, ibaksak ang pasistang orehimeng U.S. Duterte means, um, so there is now a call in the Philippines. You know, in the U.S., uh, we have, in, in the Philippines, we have been able to um, unseat or oust two uh, U.S.-backed presidents, Ferdinand Marcos and Joseph Estrada. There is now a growing call in the Philippines to oust Duterte. Um, so that's what that means. And uh, we look forward to, um, to dialoguing more um, and, and uh, seeing how we can help each other out and really raise this uh, movement to an international struggle. So U.S. out of the Philippines, U.S. out of Okinawa, U.S. out of Korea, U.S. out of Asia, down with U.S. imperialism, long live international solidarity. Thank you. Eugene Wallace and uh, Connecticut Green Party. At the start of the presentation, Korea Korean War was not described in terms of how it started. And every US news media, the schools, and the politicians automatically say that North Korea attacked South Korea. That's just the assumption. There's no other possibility. I urge people to look at I.F. Stone's book from 1953 called The Hidden History of the Korean War. More recently, The Ruses for War by John Quigley, a professor of law at Ohio State University, 2007. In 30 pages and 100 meticulous footnotes, he makes the very strong case that Sigmund Rhee in the South started the war. In the spring of 1950, Sigmund Rhee was in trouble. He lost his majority in Parliament. He was going to be taken down. John Foster Truman picked John Foster Dulles in 1949 to go to Korea to be the single ambassador to try to figure out what was happening in Korea. John Foster Dulles had conversations with Sigmund Rhee. They hooked cooked up something. He, uh, Foster Dulles spoke before the K South Korean uh, legislature and said the United States would jump in. Uh, that war... Can you shorten that up a little? Okay. That war was started by the South, by Sigmund Rhee and Wall Street. Uh, John Foster Dulles was Wall Street. Tomorrow, we are going to have a plenary. And it is, what are we going to do? And we have to begin thinking what we're going to do, not just in that hour and a half tomorrow, but in these kinds of sessions. And I would like you to think about what the United States looks like in 2030 and 24. We are totally uh, deindustrialized, much larger unemployment, the U.S. military continues at that level. Tremendous stress on the dollar and U.S. debt. 
Okay, can, uh, look, uh, no, Jim, you've been going on a long time, okay. and there's a whole lot of uh, other hands up right here. Uh, Jim, right here. Hi, I'm Jim from Troy, New York. I want to keep it short, but I have a lot to say. I just want to suggest, I know we're going to talk tomorrow about what's next. I would like to see this coalition organize groups of Americans to go to frontline issues, like Okinawa. People are in Okinawa every single day, organizing, sitting in the hot sun, blistering heat and humidity. It empowers them to see Americans standing up for them. After being there for two months last year, it changed my life. And I suggest, if anyone who hasn't been there, please go. A week, two weeks. If you go on vacations, make an exception. Go to Okinawa. There are people there that will help you, that will appreciate the shit out of you for standing with them. They will feed you, and they will love you, and they will never forget you. So please, not just Okinawa, but every frontline issue going on currently. I, this one's big for me because I was there and it's happening right now, but please. Thank, Thank you, Jim. Green shirt, green shirt. My name's John Reinch, and I want to make the point that not all bases are alike. Some are worse than others. And to make that distinction, I think we need to look to the people opposing bases in other countries. And Okinawa is a good example of that because, you know, as Will said, it's, it's got over 30 U.S. bases there. And sure, there are, peop there are Okinawans who are against all U.S. bases. There's more Okinawans who are against who would like to have the Marines leave Okinawa, but the base that has Okinawa virtually united, three out of four Okinawans want Futenma base to be closed with no Hinoko replacement. And there's, you know, there's, there's, um, there's reasons why the Hinoko base is especially vulnerable. Uh, for one thing, the claim that it's militarily, strategically necessary is total bunk. I mean, I can, I can, I can demolish that argument. On the other hand, for example, it would be a lot harder to make that case, for me to make that case at any rate, in the case of Kadena Air, Air Force One Base. But, but it's, it's very, you know, it's very weak in the case of Hanako. Another issue is that, is that the base, the, ba the Hanako replacement facility isn't there yet. It's under construction. They're, they're, they're working on the, on the uh, reclamation of it, but it's not there yet. And it's a lot easier to close All a right. base. All right, can you sum it up yet. here? Close it up. Okay. Um, We've got a lot of hands up here. Right. Uh, and another, another issue, is another reason it's full is the strength of local opposition and the fact that you've got political leadership there that opposes it. But, but the, the final thing I want to say is there, there are certainly other bases, you know, in the, in the world that, that, that we need to target. But in the case of Hanako, the Japanese government is pushing ahead. This, this year, uh, right, they're pushing right ahead with, 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 with construction and time is getting short. All right, so thank, you. Needs, thank you. Thank uh, you. Joseph, and then we're going over here. There's a couple of women on this side of the room that have their hands up. So two things, two things. Joseph Gerson with uh, Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security. You know, look, uh, what we're not really talking about right now is the danger of war with, with North Korea, right? Uh, and all these bases are related to that. Uh, when we get past the uh, functional uh, Olympic truce, uh, we'll be back on the edge. Uh, and and, and uh, that war could lead to millions of people dead. So I, I hope Hewn will, will speak to this and talk about what people are, are, are looking to do on the other side of it. Uh, quickly, in relationship to Okinawa, I've been doing work there since the, what, the, the mid-1980s. Uh, we, we had a, several of us had an interview with the U.S. Consul General uh, in Okinawa two years ago. He described uh, the entire island uh, as a U.S. base, the entire island uh, we're thinking about. Just said that anyone who didn't, you know, to kind of talk about imperial arrogance, he said that anyone in Okinawa who doesn't accept the, the U.S. 
uh, worldview, the U.S. frame of reference, is irrational and, and can't, they can't be dealt with. So this is this is this is that approach. Um, to add one other dimension here, I uh, worked for a long time with Suzu Takazato, who uh, a feminist uh, activist there, uh, who explains also the cultural imperialism. Okinawa long had the longest life span almost anywhere in the world, uh, but with the fast food that come with the bases, uh, the life expectancy in Okinawa is is now down. Just in terms of things that can be done, uh, several, I'll wrap it up. Now. I'm wrapping up to 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 a point here. Uh, a couple years ago, we did a statement in solidarity with the, the, the people of Okinawa and the people resisting the Hinoko base. We had, I think, about 70 uh, international noble, uh, notables signed it. Uh, that was carried throughout the Japanese press. Uh, you've got elections coming up now in Okinawa, both for governor and for the mayor of Hineko. Uh, they're being uh, opposed by money from the LDP, from the central government, in an effort to really buy the election. So ways in which we can find to stand with the anti-basis uh, figures, the anti-basis uh, people in Okinawa, uh, very concretely at this time of elections is critically important. Thank you very much. Leah, on this side, uh, two women over here, I believe, have their hands up. And then we're gonna go over here. We're gonna go with these two women. We've had like four or five men in a row. So we're gonna go with a couple women over here. And then we're going over here to this side of the room. Sorry, we don't have enough time to have every single person in the room speak. I mean, it's just the way it is. I'm Go Ellen ahead. Barfield. I served in the U.S. Army. I was stationed at Camp Humphreys in 1980. I am very sorry for putting my body in that position. I feel horrible about what I learned. Basically, at some point, and it was there because you know what happened in 1980 in Korea. How many else, how many other people in this room know what happened in Korea in 1980? Damp few, uh, 10 or 15, which is pretty good, but that is in a special crowd. A regular U.S. crowd, virtually no one would. There was a terrible massacre in the city of Gwangju after a big uprising because of a coup, the killing of their leader and its installation of an even worse one, and tens of thousands of U.S. troops on the ground backing all that up. I was in a maintenance unit, and we got riot training and thought we were about to have to hit the streets. What the F was I doing there? And every GI with any sense who isn't totally brainwashed when they're stationed overseas at some point goes, what the F am I doing here? And the US public has a hard time getting it, but think about there being anybody else taking 10 or 20% of our land and doing their nastiness. If you talk with them a little, they'll get it. And most GIs, if they've been in for any time, have been overseas, and they thought, what the F? So that is something we can build on. Thank you, Ellen. Hi. Again, my name is Asantua Nkrumah-Ture, Black, Black Alliance for Peace and the Green Party of Philadelphia. Um, I continue to be concerned about the relationship between militarism and local issues, particularly our U.S. police departments. So my question to Sister Bernadette, um, we know that many police departments train their officers in Israel. So to your knowledge, does the Philippines also train their police or military in Israel uh, as well? And if you, if you ever have any questions about whether folks in our cities in the United States know about the, the military and the police, they do know because if you saw what happened after Freddie Gray was killed by the Baltimore police, many of those officers have been trained in Israel as well. All right, thank you. We've got 10 minutes left. We're gonna move over to this side of the room now and give uh, a couple more women a chance to speak. Yeah, we're gonna give them uh, some time at the end, but we know, that, we know that you all haven't had a great opportunity to speak today, so we're trying to give you a little space. Sorry. Bear with us. Okay. Be kind to uh, each other. Hello. Uh, thank you. This was a really excellent, informative panel. <clears throat> Speak right the, into the mic. Okay. Please. The United States has a long and horrific history of imperialism in Asia and all the countries that you've been talking about. Um, but I wanted to ask you, particularly at this time in Korea, where Trump has um, spoken about a, a, a you know a horrendous beyond anything, you know, 
genocide of the Korean people and then in the Philippines, a fascist alliance with Duterte. What, how do you think that situation has changed now when we have such a president here as Trump and his fascist regime? So what does that mean, especially for those two countries, and what does it mean for what we should be doing here? My name is Nellie Hester Bailey. I'm a black woman, and I actually have a question. <laughs> and that question is about the pivot to Asia, uh, a military strategy for full-spectrum dominance introduced by Barack Obama, and that is the containment of China. And as we know, the power is rising in the East and also the relationship between China, Russia, and Iran, which is what we hear every day, this constant drumbeat against this McCarthyism against uh, Russia, as well as China thrown in, which is to drumbeat a war. So I wonder if any of you could discuss the pivot to Asia in terms of the military strategy of the U.S. government to reset its global hegemony with, uh, in terms of Russia and China, but in particular, China. All right, good question, thank you. Margaret, and then this brother here, and then we're gonna let them answer some questions, okay? Margaret Flowers, I have a very quick question. I haven't heard it mentioned, but the University of Maryland, right in our backyard here, is responsible for the uh, higher education at Camp Schwab in Okinawa, and my understanding is they also provide higher education on many other U.S. bases around the world. And I'm wondering if there's been any discussion about organizing around University of Maryland, whether that might be an opportunity. It's close to D.C. and right here in Maryland to uh, raise awareness and maybe put some pressure in some way on the basis. So if you have any thoughts on that. My point is I like for us to uh, really, I like to get a response from the panel around the issue of not just, but, um, I'm sorry, Trump and the Republican Party having bad policy on Asia and the military bases. But in fact, I ask people all the time when you look at the fact that Obama went into Libya after it gave up its nuclear weapons, why would we think that North Korea would want to give up their nuclear weapons? The second thing is, is that we've had a real push in this country that the problem is just the Republican Party and Trump. And I see differently. I see the problem is both the Democrat and the Republican Party that has led us to this situation and that we need to be very, very clear that in fact this idea of these war games going on twice a year in South Korea, I'd like for you to speak to that if you would, how dangerous that is to the stability of peace in Asia. All right, thank you. Let's start with Will, and then we'll just go down the line, two minutes each, please. Um, okay, wow. Um, oh yeah, what Mike spoke about visiting Okinawa and how did I get your name right? Jim. Jim, I'm sorry, Jim. Spoke about going to Okinawa um, and how that changed his life. Well, it changed my life. My first delegation was a, a delegation to Jeju and Okinawa in December 2015. Completely changed my life. I'll, I'll be dedicated to these issues for the rest of my life, and I'll be continually going to Okinawa and South Korea and wherever I can for as, as many times as possible. Um, the gentleman in the back talk about, spoke about meeting the consulate general. Uh, I believe his name is Joel. I forget his last name. I met him last year. Seems like a great person up front, but he's just another position in government that doesn't do anything. Um, my, my, the last thing I asked him last year was, have you ever visited any or spoke with any of the Okinawan activists who are out in the sit-ins every single day while your whole career here in Okinawa? And he said, no, I've never spoken to any of them. And I said, hey, if I come here next year, I'd like to speak to you, and ho hopefully you'll tell me you did at least go down to there and speak to some of the activists down there, but I doubt he, he ever will. Um, the uh, the man who spoke with, or, or uh, the lady who spoke about the Asia pivot, China, Russia, Iran, and U.S. military strategy in, in the Asia Pacific, um, for me, I think China has, has always been the number one goal. I don't know if you've ever heard of something called the century of humiliation or China's century of humiliation, roughly from 1839 to 1949. 
it, it, it kind of should have been col colonized by Western forces or Japan, but it was too big to colonize. So what they did is they carved it, that's where the term came from, they carved it up like a melon and took all of its resources and forced opium onto the Chinese people because it's a huge market. It's, it's a huge market. And look at it today. It's a huge market for manufacturing. We have to consider that. So what it is, it is a containment policy. It is a, to prepare for uh, China's economy that is growing and probably will be uh, in the next 10 years or so, the number one economy in the world. And rightly so, as David Swanson said in one of his uh, blogs, it has a big, it should have a bigger economy. It has more people. Okay, thank you, that's it. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I'd like to talk about events on the Korean Peninsula and, and prospects for this year. Um, you know, the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un gave his New Year address a few weeks ago, and he noted that this 2018 is an important year both for North and South Korea for two reasons. One, because South Korea is hosting the Olympics in February, and also for North Korea, it's celebrating its 70th anniversary of its founding in the fall of this year. He then made an overture to South Korea and said, we are willing to send a delegation to the Olympics and let's meet and talk about it. Implicit in that overture is an offer to freeze its nuclear and missile tests and to dial down the military tension during the Olympics. Also implicit in that overture is the expectation that South Korea will reciprocate that gesture by sending a delegation to the 70th anniversary celebration in the fall in North Korea and taking similar measures to dial down military tension. So I'm sure you share my cautious optimism about what's been happening this week with the North-South talks. So they met and they agreed that the North would send a delegation to the Olympics. Um, we may even see their delegations walk together during the opening ceremony, that would be great. Um, the two sides, they also said they're going to hold military talks, high level military talks soon. If these, if these talks continue to go well this year, we could also see the reunion of separated families, maybe the reopening of the Kaesong Industrial Complex, the Economic Industrial Zone, um, maybe even a summit between the North and South Korean leaders. However, what happens after the Olympics, like Joe said? Key Resolve Foal Eagle, the joint war games that happen every year in the spring has been delayed due to the Olympics, but will likely go forward in April. And then there's another one in August called Ulchi Freedom Guardian. It's another massive joint military war games that happens every year in August to September. We should note that these are very offensive exercises. Last year's Foal Eagle involved 300,000 South Korean and 15,000 US troops, uh, including the notorious SEAL Team 6. Uh, that's the team that was responsible for killing Osama bin Laden. Uh, the exercises also involved B-1B, B-52 nuclear bombers, F-22, F-35 stealth fighters, an aircraft carrier, a nuclear submarine. They rehearsed what's called Operation Plan 5015. This is a war plan that includes special forces assassinations, contingencies for North Korea's regime collapse, preemptive strikes, and the so-called Korea Massive Punishment and Retaliation Battle Plan, which involves surgical strikes against key North Korean leadership figures and military infrastructure. This is very offensive. These are not defensive exercises. The, oh, okay, just, just a couple, couple more things. So these, are, these exercises are the greatest obstacle to the efforts that have already begun for peace and North-South reconciliation. So if these exercises move ahead as planned, they are surely going to undermine the talks, the, the, the process of detente that has already begun. So I want to um, suggest two things for the conference in terms of specific acts of solidarity this year. One, lead with the demand and the US ROK military exercises. That, that has to be a lead exercise. That's, that is the lead demand for the South Korean anti-war movement this year. And in solidarity, we can take that up here. This, 
Oh, and the U.S. ROK joint military exercises. That has to be a lead demand. Um, and then the second thing I just want to um, kind of give a heads up about is that in South Korea, uh, the progressive forces that have been so fractured during the decade of conservative administrations in Korea uh, are now beginning to reconsolidate, come together. There is a new progressive party called the Minjung Party. It is a party of workers, farmers, and the urban poor that has come together. Their two priority goals are to um, and precarious labor and lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. They're focused on the June elections because they want to gain more seats in the National Assembly. But after the June elections, the second half of the year, their plan is to bring together all the anti-base forces in South Korea, form a coalition for a very robust anti-US camp base campaign. And so I think it would be very important for this coalition to, to connect with that coalition in South Korea in the second half of next year. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, very quickly to the sister from Black Alliance for Peace. Yes, there is um, cooperation between uh, Israel and the Philippine military. Um, it, well, for example, um, the, the Philippine uh, National Police Headquarters in Manila has several offices within the whole, their facility, and one of them is the NYPD. The NYPD, the New York Police Department, which is the largest global police department in the world, uh, super, I mean, uh, uh, training other global police on, uh, on counterterrorism and surveillance, has an office in, uh, in the Philippine National Head, the headquarters of the Philippine National Police, and to say, that, to say, oh, that just to say that, yes, there's also cooperation between um, the Philippine National Police and Israel Defense Forces. Um, second, on the question of um, um, the pivot, I think we have to also um, understand this pivot in the framework of political economy um, as anti-imperialists, that um, the Asia-Pacific region is... Um, actually uh, overseen by the U.S. Pacific Command, which is the largest of the global commands of the U.S. Armed Forces. So um, this idea of a recent pivot is kind of weird because the, the largest um, global command of the U.S. military has always been there. Um, and the reason why is because the Asia Pacific region is the largest uh, market for U.S. exports and the uh, contribution to the U.S. economy is hundreds of trillions of dollars. So the U.S. cannot afford to, um, to lose control over the Asia-Pacific region economically, and therefore uh, its naval positioning um, needs to be there, uh, not only also to um, control... Uh, in, the, in the South China Sea is where you find um, the majority of the crucial uh, shipping lanes and trading routes, that are, whoever has controls of these shipping lanes and trading routes controls global commerce. So therefore, the U.S. Navy needs to be there in order to protect the interests of um, U.S. monopoly capitalism. Um, and lastly, on the question on fascism and the, this fascist alliance between Trump and Duterte, it's nothing new. Um, the anti-imperialist movement in the Philippines sees the anti-fascist struggle as integral to the anti-imperialist movement. Um, imperialism in colonized nations like the Philippines uh, calls for fascism. And, um, and in historical, historically, the Philippine struggle for national liberation has grown in times of intense fascism. Uh, because fascism in many ways is one of the best recruiters of, of Philippine revolutionaries. Uh, actually, if you go to the Philippines right now, if you go to the urban centers like Manila, so many of the youth, so many of the youth of the universities are leaving the universities and going up to the mountains and joining the armed revolution because of the intensifying fascism in the cities and in the countryside. So uh, let's see how this can turn into a positive thing because, you know, a great uh, philosoph philosopher and economist once said that um, fascism is capitalism in decay. And we have to take advantage of that. No? So as fascism here in the U.S. and fascism in other parts of the world where imperialism dominates, how can we use this to our advantage? How can the people, people's resistance grow in this type of, under this condition? And we can do it. Thank you, Bernadette. And thank you all very much. Thank you all very much for your patience. Uh, we just have one last thing we want to do. Will, go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, so we have some Okinawan people that are here, and they've started a campaign to help the, the face of the movement, uh, Hiroji Yamashiro, who is being trying to try for two and a half years. And this is their banner. Give them a round of applause. And if, and if you can, go to the Facebook page, Justice for Yamashiro. There's, there's a banner there. You can see his name, and there's all, more information at the VFP table up there. Sure, why not? Real quick. Yeah. All right. Give him a big hand. Justice for Hiroji. Uh, we also started. Um, see. Postcard campaign. So we have a, uh, a blank postcard on the uh, BFP table. Um, like this, and then it's ready to go. If you can make a comment, um, this, this line, and then this postcard go to judge in Okinawa. So please um, pick up and then make a comment, and then you can give to us. We can send it to um, Okinawa. Thank you. Thank you very much.